like Paul's Magna Charta of freedom. Did I say that right? What is it? Uh, Magna Carta. Magna Carta. Know, thank you. you. I don't care. <laughs> I, I knew that didn't feel right. <laughs> the <laughs> Magna Charta. The, <laughs> Go for it. The ma- you want Mega Chart. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bible Geeks Weekly Podcast. This is episode 62. I'm Brian Sheely. I'm Ryan Joy. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. On today's episode, we're going to talk about being gracious to others, especially with this super weird time we find ourselves in. But we're in week 19 of the End of the Book Bible Reading Program. That means we're in Galatians chapters 2 through 6. And so let's start off, I guess, as we always do, finding Jesus. Where do you find Jesus here in week 19 in Galatians 2 through 6? Well, in Galatians 4 verse 19, we find Christ being formed within us, within his disciples. (laughs) This is an interesting verse. And here in Mother's Day week, Paul figuratively describes what I imagine to be the worst possible Mother's Day gift. (laughs) (laughs) Having to give birth to your grown children all over again. (laughs) He says, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. (laughs) And as someone who only was an invested bystander (laughs) in... In four different births, I can still say, uh, man, that that's an awful idea, <laughs> figuratively even, this idea of laboring again. I, I had the... Uh the privilege, I suppose, of watching <laughs> watching our four kids be born. Caught a few of them. And um, just he talks here about this pain of childbirth, the anguish of childbirth. And I guess the idea is... Paul had given birth to these kids once before, and now because they're departing from the gospel as it was properly taught to them, he feels like he's having to go through all of that work, all of that pain, all of the stress and worry about them all over again. And the the birth that he wants to bring forth is Jesus Christ living in them. And that mm-hmm. is the, the most interesting and wonderful part of this whole verse is this idea that to understand discipleship, we need to understand that it is this process of Jesus being formed within us, letting the Lord's way of thinking and living grow within each one of us so that we can say with Paul, as he did a couple chapters earlier, hopefully I'm not stealing your finding Jesus (laughs) in chapter two, (laughs) chapter two, verse 20, he said, It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's what he wants all of them and all of us to be able to say. And so Mm -hmm. um, he's laboring to form that loving, obedient spirit in them again so that they can live in harmony as they uh, as they are meant to be. And we'll we'll get into what all of this means in Galatians five and six as to how they should live here in a little bit. But anyways, that's that's where I found Christ is interestingly becoming birthed and formed within each of us. What about you? Yeah, Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And I love the picture that he presents here Mm -hmm. of Christ becoming a curse. It seems so weird to think about Christ becoming a curse. And really, the language that he's using is very similar to the language he uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that Christ became sin for us. He represented or embodied a curse or sin to save us from the curse, to save us from sin. So he became the very thing that we deserved so that we could be saved from that. And every time I think about the punishment that he endured, it's so unfair because he was sinless. He didn't deserve to hang on that cross. We deserve to hang on the cross. I deserve to hang on the cross. And Jesus was the one who took all of that punishment on himself and allowed us to avoid that punishment. The fact that he took it on himself means that 
I can be free from that punishment. And the love that it took for that to happen, the sacrifice that it took for that to happen in Christ, all of these blessings of Abraham from the Old Testament all the way to today comes true that Jesus brought us the ability to be forgiven of our sins. And I just, I love this verse. I think it's great. And picturing Jesus as cursed is not a fun thing to think about. Yeah. But it is very comforting knowing that I don't have to go through that because he went through it for me. I think your description of him taking our punishment is apt in that earlier, there's another curse a couple verses earlier in Galatians 3 here that's spoken of from the mm-hmm. curses listed for disobedience in Deuteronomy 27, where there is there are consequences for Israel breaking the covenant. And the consequences of them breaking the covenant is going to be all kinds of of curses placed upon them, many of which they lived, you know, they they had yeah. all these hard things come upon them because they turned away from the Lord. So the curse of not following the law is met with the curse of anyone hanged on a tree. That is, Jesus takes a punishment. Those who are sinning deserve this consequence, this curse. And so it's like they they cross each other off, so to speak, uh, these two mm-hmm. different curses. And I, I love your parallel, too, of Second Corinthians 5.21. It's interesting. I always think of that sin there as maybe, maybe talking about not Christ just becoming our sin, but it's the same Greek word is used for a sin offering. So it's possible right. that he's he's talking about Christ becoming that God made him who had no sin to be the sin offering for us and and that way like you're saying he's dying in our stead his blood is offered for our sins to save us from the curse. Anyway, yeah, it's, well, it is a powerful idea. It's just a big reminder for especially for the Galatians like don't go back to the old law. Like if you really want to go back to the old law then there's punishments involved if you don't keep it perfectly. Yeah. And the only way to take care of that punishment of the old law that's required of those who don't follow it is someone to follow it perfectly on your behalf and this sacrifice that's required. And that's what Jesus is. And if you want to, if you want to go back to the old law, if you want to demand that everyone who's saved today is circumcised or follows all these days or, or all these, things that were in the old law, well, then you're basically missing the whole point of why Jesus came in the first place. And you have a requirement on you that you could never bear as just, again, that's why a lot of Galatians reminds me of Hebrews, which the Hebrew writer constantly is is pointing them back to like, why do you want to go back to the old law? And Paul's basically doing the same thing here for the Galatians. Like, don't go back to the old law because it's not going to be very good for you without Jesus. It's a great parallel because both of them, both of those two letters have this sense of shock and worry and urging. And there's this urgency to, to both right. Hebrews and Galatians. Like, I am astonished that you would do this. I, yeah. I want them to emasculate themselves in these awful terms, you know, that are in this, this. It's it, shocking. It's, it really. is. A, it's a shocking letter when, and it's interesting because it has these shocking bolts of lightning. And in between is this very carefully reasoned theological argument. And then he comes mm-hmm. back in chapter four to this shocking statement. And then he goes away from it. And, and um, the book of Hebrews is full of this urging, don't go back, stay true to what actually saved you, just like this one. These are two great books to study right after, say, a quarter studying the old law, and then go oh, study sure. Galatians and Hebrews. Uh, it's very fitting. Well, and and you have to understand that in the context of what the Gentiles are dealing with right now, the Galatian church is dealing with right now is really... These Judaizing teachers who continue to kind of follow in Paul's footsteps and try to turn his work upside down and try to influence negatively the churches that he's established, that he's, like you said, like he's birthed almost. And they're going around in behind him, stirring up these people saying, no, what Paul told you to do really isn't all you need to do. You really need to 
X, Y, and Z, you know, all, all the things that they're trying to get them to do from the old law. And they're causing a lot more problems that he's having to deal with here and that the Hebrew writer is having to deal with here. And it's just, it's a constant theme throughout the New Testament is like, don't go back to the old law. And, and maybe it's not so much a problem for us today. I don't, I don't think any of us are really tempted to go back to the old law. But, you know, if we want to hold on to our perfect keeping of God's will for us, well, that's not going to work either. And so maybe the application for us is just realizing that you and I are not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. And we will always need Jesus. Always. And it's not about keeping the will perfectly. It's not about doing everything exactly 100% correct because nobody can. We all need Jesus. Yeah, that's definitely one one application is that sufficiency of Christ. I think another application right now as, you know, you look at the headlines and you see this debate, this uh, the kind of people lashing out around the charges that came down about Ahmad Arbery. Oh, yeah. And I've seen brethren arguing and fighting. And I think we've talked before about some of the existing racial divides that that still kind of sit there in in the church, even and certainly all over the world. And I think if we understand what Paul is really shocked by and what he's really fighting for here, we'll see that this is an argument for unity in the church across ethnic boundaries. Mm -hmm. And whenever he says you've distorted the gospel he's not saying you've you've turned to a different system of salvation or religious rituals or or something like that so much as uh, the you know some of those things might be true but at the heart of it you have distorted the message the announcement the good news the great proclamation we have to make which is that Jesus is the Lord of all the earth. Jesus yeah. is the Christ. And whenever he says, he quotes what Abraham heard as the gospel in Galatians chapter three, a few verses earlier from what you read, he says, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. <laughs> the proclamation, the gospel is all the nations will be blessed through the son of David, which is Jesus Christ. I mean, there's a lot to it and I, I don't want to put it in a nutshell because the gospel has a lot of, you know, it, its fingers reach throughout the whole Bible, but at its heart, this is one of the core things we have to get about what the gospel is. And so whenever they were saying you have to be Jews in order to be saved, you have to be circumcised and convert to Judaism. Yep. He saw that they were not no longer saying all nations will be saved. All the Gentiles will be saved. And that is distorting the gospel. And, and so we need to hear that message of unity of slave nor free, male nor female, black or white or whatever ethnicity across any situation, any spectrum. We need to understand in Christ, we are one and, and fight for that kind of unity in Christ. I think that's probably the biggest message that we should probably take away from this episode and reading Galatians really is all about unity. And so let's get into our second segment here. And that's scripture du jour. What is the soup du jour? It's the soup of the day. Mm, that sounds good. I'll have that. So we're in Galatians 5. And I was really happy that we landed on <laughs> Galatians 5. Because somebody decided to steal Galatians 5 away from us in our <laughs> Bible bracket recently. <laughs> There were a lot of people that voted for 1 Corinthians 15 over Galatians 5. <laughs> I happen to be the deciding vote. I love Galatians oh, 5, too. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're in Galatians 5, one of my favorite chapters. I honestly think Galatians 5 could have made it to the very end. So what do you grab from Galatians 5 that really just stands out at you? Obviously, there's a lot here, and in the background <laughs> of all of this will be the works of the flesh and especially the fruit of the Spirit. but. I think that 
in light of what we're going to talk about here a little later, it's really helpful to zero in on this statement in chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, about what our freedom should lead us towards. So this book has often been called the the letter of liberty. It's like Paul's Magna Charta of freedom. Did I say that right? What is it? Uh, Magna Carta. Magna Carta. Know, thank you. you. I don't care. <laughs> I knew that didn't feel right. The <laughs> Magna <laughs> Charta. The, <laughs> Go for it. The Whatever ma- you want Make a chart. Okay, so <laughs> this is <laughs> this is Paul's statement of freedom, declaration of freedom, right? Okay. Um, and, and he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Freedom is dangerous, right? Because you can abuse it. But he says, let this become an opportunity for you all the more to serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. (laughs) It's a lot of words. (laughs) Through through one statement. One sentence Mm -hmm. really summarizes the whole law. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And so it closes with this statement of cannibalistic predatory behavior, (laughs) eating one another alive. And if you look around at the political world, at just the world in general, you see this kind of behavior, this this kind of um, of attacking each other and devouring Mm -hmm. each other. And um, I think. The flesh brings out selfishness and conflict, which we'll, we see right after this in the work of the flesh. And the spirit-sourced attributes that he'll talk about lead to peace. And so we've been set free. Why? So that we can serve. And I, I think that a love for neighbor that's equal to your love for self is this guiding light that Paul wants us to hold on to. Sometimes it's the simple things when we can boil something down to something we can just come back to again and again. It's way easier than having in our mind all kinds of rules for conduct. And so Paul Mm -hmm. tells us, just keep this in your mind, fulfill this command, love your neighbor as yourself, and it's going to help you find your way in whatever situation you find yourself in with brethren or with the world. Yeah, it's important, I think, for us to distinguish between what we've been commanded to do versus what we have the freedom to do. You can really look at the New Testament and all the instructions that we've been given, especially by Jesus and by all of the apostles in the New Testament. We can really see that we have a a certain fundamental set of things that we need to do or we have to do, but we have a lot of freedom there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways to do those things. There's a lot of abilities and and options really for us to do things differently and we see that all the time you know when do we meet for services what is the what is the scriptural time for us to meet for services what's the scriptural color of the carpet or whatever it is you know all these things that people divide themselves over and we have so much freedom outside of these instructions or commands that we've been given and i think a lot of that we have a tendency in a really unfortunate way to make divisions over and Paul's begging them, please don't do that. Don't divide yourself over things that you just have the freedom to do, that you have the liberty to do, that you can choose amongst yourselves to do. Don't don't divide over those things because if you do, then you may end up devouring each other, which is just a terrible thought to, to think about. Yeah, I think that a, a, sets the context really well for um, some of the things that we're seeing right now happening in the church as people are trying to figure out how to how to serve God in a new situation as hopefully we're making finding our way out of uh, some of the restrictions we found ourselves in. But even now, you see folks with with all different perspectives about how we should handle this public health crisis and what it means mm-hmm. to love your neighbor and what it means to s- serve God, really. And so I think if we just have those applications in the back of our minds as we read Paul, it's it's going to help us to do exactly what he tells us to do, which is to live and be led by the Spirit. 
So we did a whole series, which we'll link to in the show notes here, about the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm not going to get into the fruit of the Spirit in my scripture du jour insight that I found here, because we've covered it, I mean, at length. But I want to highlight something that he says at the end of the chapter here in verses 25 and 26, when he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so what I think sometimes we typically go to the fruit of the Spirit to do is we go to the fruit of the Spirit and we, we list these attributes that we need to have in our lives. But maybe we miss the context here. And I'm just going to fully acknowledge that uh, one, of my, one of our dear brothers, Alan Greeley, was someone who, in a recent lesson that I heard of his, he pulled this point out very applicably. And I love the point that he made that basically the fruit of the Spirit is kind of the meat in the middle of the one another sandwich. So the verses you talked about were all about one another, right? It, it, it's this devouring one another, consumed by one another, in love, serve one another. Mm-hmm. And then after he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he goes back to talking about one another, provoking one another, envying one another. And in the context of what he's really saying here is that the fruit of the Spirit really has to do with how we deal with one another. And it's the relationships. It's the kinds of ways that we deal with our brothers and our sisters. And summarizing it kind of at the end here, he basically says, if we're going to keep in step with the Spirit, if we're going to follow along with the Spirit, let's not become overly prideful, let's not provoke one another, and let's not envy one another. And so the fruit of the Spirit really helps us remove our fleshly, competitive, antagonistic attitudes towards each other. You know, we're really focused on each other's good. We're focused on each other's well-being rather than trying to compare ourselves with each other, rather than becoming almost in a competitive sense, anti each other. And building unity really is is focused on these qualities of the fruit of the spirit that he he talks about here in this middle section. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. The meat in the middle. That's a lot of meat in the middle. It's a it's a ton of meat. It's a Jason's deli sandwich. It's like <laughs> it's like a cow between two crackers, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's just a lot of meat. And then yeah, this idea that captures it all, that bookends it, it really doesn't just extend to those two one another pieces of bread on either side. Really the whole <laughs> book is is about bringing that harmony and the the obstacle to it has been these agitators these troublemakers who've come in and distorted the gospel but really what paul is leading to throughout this book just like the book of romans that he what he was building to throughout his whole theological argument in that book is this harmony that comes from following the way of the spirit the way of christ and um, i love this statement to Oh, so love it. This this statement, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Mm-hmm. That it's a picture of marching to the the same rhythm or, or staying in step. Like when you're you're walking with someone or when my kids are, are walking with me, hey, keep up with me. Walk with me. Yeah. Don't don't fall behind. <laughs> <laughs> You've i I'll set the pace. You march to my drum. Yeah. All right. So let's get into our third and final segment here. We're going to talk about in all of these difficult times that we're going through right now, how do we show grace and patience to people who have different views or different opinions than we do? Now that we've gotten into a situation where probably a lot of us are worshiping in some very different situations. I know you talked about your congregation is worshiping in your cars now. at the building, you know, it just, it's a lot of change and people are not comfortable with change. But with all of these changes that we've been going through in our churches, in our relationships with each other, how do we still focus on giving grace and showing patience during these times? I've been thinking about this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, at the beginning of the, the chapter It says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. 
This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. And so this gives me this picture of balloons and bricks. (laughs) (laughs) You're either puffing or you're building. That's visceral right there. (laughs) Yeah. This word puffing (laughs) is used uh, several times in 1 Corinthians. It's kind of interesting how he uses it. Even the picture of leaven growing or puffing up the bread kind of has this sense of puffing. But knowledge without love can make us swell in our empty inflation of ourselves. It's like a bubble blower. Are you a bubble blower? (laughs) Uh, I love to blow some bubbles. You know, I didn't (laughs) learn to blow bubbles until late uh, with my bubble gum. I was was a late bubble blower, like a (laughs) late high school bubble blower. But uh, yeah, it's like like blowing bubbles and inflating something full of air. Or are we going to be people that can build other people up and have mm-hmm. some real substance to what we're building, letting go of that self-righteous need to fill ourselves up and show everyone we know the right answer, rather steadily securing a solid structure, you know, building a temple for God in other people. Mm -hmm. And I've seen and I've heard comments on different sides, whether it's talking to people, emails going around with us, um, and certainly on social media about all these coronavirus issues that sound honestly to me a lot more like puffing of knowledge than the building of love. People feel sometimes like they have the moral high ground. Sure. So we might say, I don't care if it offends you or not. This is what I think. And then we go on to blast (laughs) others for not loving people enough. You remember Ken Leach used to say a whole lot about these like red alert kinds of (laughs) phrases that we use. Caution, danger, Will Robinson. Watch out here. If you're going to say something like this, what follows it probably is not is not going to be very good. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you hear out of your mouth, I don't care if it offends you or not, (laughs) (laughs) you know, maybe... Maybe there's something that needs to prick someone's heart and it's an absolute right and wrong thing, but that's probably not a good sign if you're starting that way. You know, like people feel strongly about that you should wear a mask and you should have social distance or you should stay at home and not go out. Or Mm -hmm. on the other hand, that that people are trying to take others' freedom away or people are being too cautious and staying home from services or not cautious enough and shaking someone's hands. You know, all these different things that people right. are are judging each other whenever it it's not like someone is taking the stand against something that scripture says something really clearly about. It's just in the application, trying to find what is the right way. And and maybe, you know, I have my own opinions about all this stuff. It's not like these things don't matter. But we are hardcore people in the church. We're <laughs> we're full of convictions and knowledge. And at times we get so full of our distinctive convictions, I think, that we might miss the fact that there are reasons others have landed on a different position or perspective, or maybe it's from their ignorance, or maybe like these Gentile Christians in First Corinthians 8, they have had a different experience that constrains their consciences differently. You know, there's just a lot of different things that a conversation, a dialogue might be appropriate, patience with each other, loving, forgiving. Somebody kissed you on the cheek and you feel like that shouldn't have happened. Feel free to talk about them, but also have some love and some patience in your heart for that. You know, I mean, uh, that's something that happened (laughs) to our family. Uh, And it's, it's not a big deal. It's really not. These things matter, but they don't matter as much as some of these greater things that that Paul is here fighting for, you know? I think we have a very large tendency, especially right now, to make mountains out of molehills. Mm -hmm. And we have, there's a phrase, the narcissism of minor differences. (laughs) Oh, that's a good phrase. Where we like to find the one small difference that somebody has or the one small difference differing opinion somebody shares from us and we like to highlight that as being like the major thing that makes us feel superior to them or feel like it's okay to minimize their opinion or disregard them completely and this is i think a huge danger right now that we need to be very very careful 
as we're looking to things like Galatians, as we just got done looking at Romans, you know, looking at the book of Hebrews, we don't need to be dividing on silly things that, that don't, at the end of the day, really distinguish us from each other. You know, if we really want to be building unity, it needs to be because of the right things and focused on the right things, not because we all wear masks in public or we don't all wear masks in public or we have the same opinions on political issues or we don't have the same you know, opinions on political issues. Whatever they are, those things don't matter. And we need to be very, very clear, I think, on what does matter and what doesn't matter. And for those things that don't matter, I, I'm with you. I, I think we need to just let them go and realize that we all have reasons. I think that's something that you're, that you're highlighting here, too. Everyone's doing the best they can. You know, we're really just living life the best we can right now. And people are going to make different decisions for different reasons. And that's okay. Just so long as we're all focused on Christ, making these kinds of of dividing lines between ourselves really is not going to help us. Yeah, I think that's where the the distinction needs to be. D- making a dividing line is not necessary. It's not that it doesn't matter at all. You know, if I understand, for instance, our, our congregation has a lot of vulnerable folks that mm-hmm. physically vulnerable that have sickness and, and, and real need for us all to be sensitive to them and their situation for them to be able to to come and be amongst us or, you know, maybe they feel like they can't. Uh, but, but for us to try to do what we can to put them in a good situation, it it matters. And, you know, their health matters to us. We pray about it. We are happy whenever they get a good treatment plan. We're sad whenever they get good, you know, bad tests come back. But the point is this this thing that you're saying that it's not worth dividing over it doesn't matter like that and yeah. same thing on the other side you know you can understand where people are coming from and i'm not utterly dismissing that you have no point and your opinions don't matter uh, at all <laughs> it's just that we have to keep first things first and and not you know major and minors and let that become our real focus here and let that let break i mean imagine destroying a relationship or worse destroying a brother's faith because they become so discouraged about you expressing your judgment on them because they made a mistake you know they they didn't mean to to give you a hug but they were overwhelmed in that moment and they forgot themselves and they just were so excited to see you. And yeah. then you lambaste them about it. And, you know, we just have to work through it. Do you, can you talk about it? Sure. If you feel like you need to talk about it, express it to them. But do it in the right way, in a way that builds one another up rather than biting and devouring one another. Well, and that mistake that they may have made may not be a mistake in reality. Mm. It may just have been your interpretation of it. And I think that's what Paul's saying here. Knowledge puffs up. Yeah. You know, if you fill yourself up and man, isn't that just what we all love to do right now? Mm. I mean, so many people are just looking at the data. We're looking at the stats and the graphs and the charts (laughs) and the everything we're looking at. We're just filling ourselves up with knowledge. Yeah. And we just want to know every facet of everything. And we want to... We want to just try to understand this to the best of our ability, but knowledge puffs up. Mm -hmm. And the more we use data and stats and all these things to attack each other, the the farther off we're going to be from grace, patience, and, and really love. I think that's the focus here that we need to come back to is just realizing that everyone's doing the best they can with the with the information they've been given. And if if somebody feels like it's important to keep their distance, then keep your distance and and respect that. But if if somebody feels like giving you a hug because they haven't seen you in seven weeks, I mean, okay. And I love something that Paul said in Romans 14, another one of these chapters that really is kind of part and parcel with 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul said, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of any brothers. 
basically Paul is saying, look, I'm not, I'm not going to think about myself as the sole source of authority on all things. If somebody believes something different than I do, and it's not really a matter of, of faith or conviction, or am I going to use my opinions or my strongly held beliefs to drive a wedge between us? Or am I really more interested in pursuing love and wholeness for those around me? And I think that's just something we need to continually come back to. Yeah, the word opinion is a critical, is a key word in just right there at the beginning of Romans 14 and verse right. verse 1. And, you know, opinions are are not, it's not wrong to have an opinion and your opinion might be the right one. You can make a strong argument for it, but opinions need to have their proper place. I, and I, I like that you're using that that term. It's different yeah. than the faith, <laughs> right? Sure. I've been reading this book recently. I, I finished it, but I'm going back through it again. It's called Scoot Over and Make Some Room. My aunt uh, recommended this book to me. Mm-hmm. It's by Heather Avis. Anyway, there's a chapter in this book. It's called You Do You. And it reminds me of the episode that we had our wives on about comparison and talking about comparing ourselves to other people. And I think that was a phrase that was used in that episode a couple of times. Mm -hmm. You know, you do you. Like, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of options on how we parent our kids, on how we live our lives in general. And especially now, like how we interact with society, how how we exist in this world. And if you feel like, you need to go out with a mask on, you do you, you know? I mean, that's just, you're doing the best with the information you have available, you do you. And I I feel like that's a lot of what Paul's talking about here in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, you take the information that that is available to you and you do the best thing you can. And I'm not going to judge you for that because I love you, I care about you, and I'm not going to use that as a way to divide us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the couple verses after the one you read just a minute ago in Galatians 5, getting into Galatians 6, mm-hmm. let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. You'll, have, you'll each have to bear your own load. And that word is the word for a... A soldier's pack. Each soldier has their own load to bear. And you square your pack away, somebody else squares their pack away. And the step beyond that is whenever we also remember verse two, a couple verses, the verse before that, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the Mm -hmm. law of Christ. So we bear our own load. That is, I'm responsible to do me. And, and other people are responsible to do them. And we get ourselves in trouble when we get too caught up in someone else's um, in, in trying to enforce and make sure that someone else is lined up with our opinions. But at the same time, there's this this stepping beyond it to look out for others. And let me just give you a really quick example of that, that I was encouraged by somebody at our congregation has a 3d printer and she said you know i'm not a big um i'm not a big mask guy i haven't myself worn masks but i know this is something that's important to everybody and so i he volunteered to print all of these ear savers some of them have like batman (laughs) and superman on them or to print plastic face masks that they can put you can put a a cloth filter in and it's just like first of all i'm taking responsibility for me everybody do is trying to do their best but here's a way just one small example of somebody saying but maybe i can help bear your burden as well here's a way maybe i can help and i and and so if we that really just builds bridges when you see a bunch of people loving other people and trying to help and trying to figure it out and letting our views on things even be swayed by the views and needs of others, not because this is what I believe, but because this is going to bless you. And what does it really cost me? I think another thing that we need to think about just here in closing probably is from First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, where Paul says, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. 
So two things there that Paul reminds us of, your leaders, those elders in your congregation who are trying the best that they can to make decisions on behalf of the congregation for a for as good choices as they can possibly make. Mm-hmm. But then the ultimate goal here to be at peace among ourselves. And so those two things to remember is that if you're in a congregation that has elders who are making decisions, respect them. Respect them for the choices that they're making. Respect them for the leadership that they're giving because they're doing the best that they can. And their choices may not be your choices if you were in that position, but respect them. And respect the fact that they're that they're really taking all the evidence under consideration and doing exactly what they think is the right decision. But at the end of the day, be at peace among yourselves. And that's just a reminder for every situation we can be in. No matter where we're at, if we can be at peace among ourselves, that's the goal. That's what we really want. We don't need to be fighting with each other. We don't need to be judging each other or looking down on each other for these different decisions we might make because of conscience or knowledge or whatever it is that we've come up with. We just need to to get back to that kind of peace that we need to experience with each other. And that's really what Galatians is all about, that kind of unity that we need to have as a church. Yeah, it's easy to say until you're faced (laughs) with someone who is doing the thing that bothers you. And whenever you feel most frustrated or perturbed or people aren't making the wise choice, whether you think it's, like you said, whether you think it's your leaders or, or your brother or whoever it is, that's when you most need to apply it. That's when we need to, as we just read in James last week, we need to hear and do what we know is right to be at peace among ourselves. All right, so let's get into the challenge for this episode. And based on the things that we've been talking about, I think a good challenge for us would be to practice patience with someone whose choices don't particularly align with yours this week. And you're going to come up with some ideas about how to structure your family, how to structure your relationships you know, whether you wear a mask or not, whether you go to the grocery store or not, you know, all these things, practice patience with someone. And, and just a good reminder for us to not unnecessarily divide ourselves based on the different choices we all might be making right now. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into the Bible Geeks podcast. You can find us on our website at BibleGeeks.fm. You can find show notes for this episode at BibleGeeks.fm slash 62 you've got anything that you want us to talk about on upcoming episodes, please reach out to us. You can contact us through our website. You can send us a message on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or wherever it might be. Let us know what you want to hear about, and we'd love to talk about it on upcoming episodes. Until next week, everyone, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom. Shalom.